Hey everybody, a little intro for today's episode. This is one I'm really excited about. If you saw the title, you can probably understand why. <laughs> but today I finally get a chance to interview one of my heroes, Tom Shippey. I've been referencing him on the podcast for a long time, and I'll get into all that uh, during the show. But I did want to do a little intro for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we had quite a few technical difficulties during the recording of this, and so I did my best to stitch it together so you couldn't tell. Uh, but, you know, if there are a couple of weird transitions or whatever, that's that's probably why we had to do a lot of stitching on this episode to make it work. Um, and then the other thing is I wanted to, before every episode for the next little while, remind everybody about uh, the meetup that we're doing next February in, uh, well, it's not Salt Lake City, but it's close to Salt Lake City. It's our 10th anniversary next February. We're doing a meetup. Uh, if you want some more information, there's a whole channel for that on our Discord server. Uh, there's a page with a little bit of info on the website, so you can go to thelegendarium.com. Uh, but if you're able to get here, or if you're already here in Utah, then it won't cost you anything to come. We'll hang out, we'll have special guests, prizes, activities. It, it'll be a really fun weekend, so I hope you can make it out. Now, enjoy this episode, for which I was actually pretty nervous going in. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. I am your host, Craig Hanks, here with a very special episode because I have with me one Tom Shippey. Tom, how are you today? Pretty good, thanks. Yep. Good, good. And I, I understand you're getting over a, a bout of COVID, for which I'm sorry, but uh, we're going to power through. Mm, okay. And the other thing I was going to say is uh, I'm missing a tooth. And I can't get it fixed because I've had COVID, you know, nobody wants to see me. Okay. Uh, but apart from that, we're okay. That's right. That's right. We're, yeah. Like I said, we'll power through. Uh, for longtime listeners of the show, you know that uh, Tom Shippey is the second most uh, referred to author on this show right after Tolkien himself. I've been a big fan of Tom's work for a long time. I reference it a lot. Uh, heck, just go back to, I think it was episode 181 when we talked about uh, Leaf by Niggle. And I think the most common phrase on that show was, according to Shippy. Uh, so <laughs> we've been talking about your stuff for a long time, and I'm really pleased to have you here today. Uh, but we're going to talk about something that was spurred on by the conversation I had a few weeks ago with Philip Chase, where he and I were talking about Beowulf. And he kept referencing your translation, this brand new translation of Beowulf that you did with uh, Leonard Nydorf. And That's right. uh, I, I received my copy. Yep, there it is. <laughs> we're we're going to be hawking this thing relentlessly throughout the show. Um, I, he's, he mentioned during our conversation, he's, I, I said, what's your favorite translation? He says, you know what? This new one is actually making a real strong case for being my, my favorite. And so I bought my copy. It arrived a couple of days ago. And I'll be darned if uh, if old Philip Chase wasn't right. I really enjoy it. Um, and wanted to, before we go on to our main topic of the uh, the kind of intersection of Beowulf and Tolkien and, and what that means for uh, us modern readers, um, I wanted to just kind of ask you for a a quick overview of your experience translating this and, uh, you know, finally getting something out with your name on it that's a, a translation and not simply a, a commentary, well, just simply, uh, not just a commentary on it. Sure. Well, um, it, it's a funny thing because, uh, you know, Beowulf has uh, been out in the world for more than 200 years and it's been translated many, many times. And actually, when you think of all the students who have to translate it as part of their courses, millions of hours have been spent on translating Beowulf. You'd think we'd got it straight by now. Um, and I think in a way we have. <laughs> There's a couple of places where I really don't quite know, and nobody else knows exactly what is meant. But uh, basically, we, we've got a good idea of, of, of what it means. But translating it is still difficult because um, it's a kind of poetry that we don't know anymore. And uh, it's difficult to adjust to that. Um, I'd say very, very quickly, it's like this. In poetry nowadays, we value originality 
and uh, surprise and uh, getting the words exactly right. Whereas I can't help thinking that this kind of poetry values um, doesn't value originality. It values reinforcement. It values uh, saying uh, saying the things that everybody knows. It's um, it's um, uh, um, it's expressing uh, an entire ethos, uh, the ethos of the particular group, and that is its job. Um, and so we have to, and of course, that group is not our group. So we have to try to um, get along with that as best we can. And uh, that's why I think people struggle with it. Um, anyway, I have a, a preface in the book. The book here consists of, well, there's Len Nydorf's introduction, and then there's um, me on, oh, then, yeah, th then there's me on the problem of translating, and then there's the text. So you've actually got the original words there and my translation facing so you can see what, you know, what I think it means. And then there's Len's commentary. And right at the end, there's an appendix by me on uh, the connection between Beowulf and Tolkien. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's what I've been telling people is it's, um, it, it's a full service Beowulf. Um, there's lots of translation out. But they don't have commentaries with them. There's some commentaries there, but they don't have translations with them. Okay, but really, you've got pretty much the lot here, and you also got, I should say, a gigantic bibliography uh, in Len's commentary in case you want to see what other people think about it. Though I must say, when I look at the bibliography, I think I'm never going to read all that. Um, but if you do <laughs> want to, well, there it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. It's so that's, uh, that's as I was uh, as, as I was reading through, uh, or I should say, uh, skimming through because I haven't. Uh, I've only had it for a couple of days, and so I haven't gone through the entire thing. Uh, but as I'm skimming through, I, I the thought kept occurring to myself: My gosh, I wish I'd had this when I was a student because I I am one of those uh, millions of students that you describe. Uh, you know, yeah. dutifully. Uh, going after Beowulf and trying to translate the old English. And uh, it, yeah, it was very, yeah, yeah. It, th that was a tough and two semesters. Looking, looking the words up in the back of familiar exercise, yes. which we all have done uh, for hours and hours on end. Yeah, that's right. So actually one thing is um, we hope this will be adopted as a course book and that would be good. Mm. And the other thing I, I must say is um, if you want to find out about it, go to UppsalaBooks.com. UppsalaBooks.com, and there you will see this, and you'll also see the second book we have now published, which is this, the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, um, which is a work I've often heard of and never read, and you'll also see mm. uh, what we hope to publish in the future, which I think is very suitable for Watchers of Legendarium, because our, sent our concentration is on Myth and legend and folk tale and fairy tale and ancient works. Right, that's pretty much the legendary. So the, yeah, uh, list Uppsala as well. books. U P P. So, uh, so if, uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I I went to the website and uh, and was properly intrigued by the offerings that you're showing there. Uh, and I love the logo, by the way. Yeah. It's. Uh, I I love being able to say, "Oh, I've been there." <laughs> and walked those hills. Uh, it's uh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's, let's talk about uh, Tolkien and Beowulf. As you said, this is kind of an, an essay that you, it feels almost like you snuck this in. Like, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to throw this in, uh, in as an appendix to this book. And it's very interesting because it tracks uh, a, a few instances of where you think uh, Tolkien was, um, uh, was influenced by or inspired by Beowulf and his work on the poem. Maybe do we start with Tolkien himself? Yes. Yeah, I think we do. I have a broader question, but that can wait. Why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about Tolkien's history with the poem as we know it, uh, when, when he started reading it and, and what effect it may have had on him? Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll say something right at the start, which is uh, off the wall. Um, at the start of one of my essays, I asked the question, did Tolkien think 
he was the Beowulf poet reincarnated. <laughs> and people say, well, of course he didn't. And actually, they're quite right. Of course he didn't, because he was a devout Christian and he didn't believe in reincarnation. But he was very interested in reincarnation. OK, and I'd add, though people don't know it, that belief in reincarnation in traditional families, especially from the Scandinavian area, is quite common. Indeed, there is a, a folk belief, which my family certainly follows, which is you don't call children after living relatives. You try to keep the name alive. Yep. But you don't call but you call it after dead relatives because you want the name to stay alive. And, well, what goes with the name? So I mm. think I could say without exaggeration that Tolkien felt a very strong connection with the Beowulf poet um, from an early age. And this actually became stronger and stronger. Well, shall I start with the early age bit? Um, I think Tolkien's first use of Beowulf is in a poem he wrote, oh, in the 1920s, when he was uh, at the University of Leeds. Um, and the poem is called um, um, You Mona Gold, Galdra Bewunden, which means the gold of men of ancient time wound round with spell. Well, that phrase wound round with spell, I think Tolkien never forgot it. Do you remember it comes up in uh, uh, in the Lord of the Rings, when Pippin stabs the Nazgul and his sword taken from the barrow works because it's been wound round with spells. So, uh, of course, from men of ancient time. Uh, so he never forgot the phrase. And he also kept rewriting the poem. Uh, he, the poem actually eventually came out in the adventures of Tom Bombadil as the Horde. Um, but Tolkien kept as he always did, he kept uh, kept fiddling with it. Nevertheless, the the theme of it remained the same all the way through. Tolkien was uh, deeply interested in the idea of the horde, in the idea of the dragon, and in what he called in the Hobbit the dragon sickness, the dragon sickness, the the horde or human a god Galdrava Wunden. It's all about the dragon sickness and how people catch it in turn. Uh, First the elves, then the dwarf, then the then the king, then the dragon. They all succumb to the dragon sickness. So it was clearly a, um, a, 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 an important part of his earliest, uh, what shall I call it, his earliest philosophy. Um, mm. And he kept bringing it into his fiction as well. So that was the, the, the start of it. I, and then there are other things. These are uh, speculations, you know. How do we account for the Valar? Where did Tolkien get that from? Well, right at the start of Beowulf, uh, uh, we actually have a funeral. And the funeral is of Shield Shaving. And we are told that he, King of the Danes, actually came to the Danes as a, a foundling in a, in a boat washed up on shore. But he was sent. He was sent to help the Danes in their distress. Now, who sent him? Well, it says here, um, talking about his death now, um, uh, that uh, the mourners certainly did not provide him with fewer offerings from the nation's wealth than those ones did who first sent him out in the beginning, just an infant alone over the waves. So whoever sent him, was it's providential, but it wasn't God because it's plural, but it is in a way the agents of God and it's also clear that they are somewhere across the ocean, and it must be the Western Ocean. Um, and al already we have the basic ideas of the Valar. They are, shall we say, God's agents, and they come, and they are located in the West, and they send people from the West, and people are sent back. And already you have the idea of the Lost Road, the Lost Road to Amman, to the, the Undying Lands. So actually... In, in a way, I think Tolkien got the idea from the word those, just the word those. And Remarkable. though I, I, I hesitate to explain it, I think it stuck out to him because it is metrically unusual. And Tolkien, who was very good at meter, couldn't help noticing that and wondering why this normally unstressed word got such heavy stress in this case. So... Um, 
okay, I think Tolkien got the Valar idea uh, from from there. Um, uh, uh, he also got the idea of wound round with spells from there. And um, there's another thing which I have often tried to explain, and I usually make a botch of it because, <laughs> because it's difficult, and I try to <laughs> oversimplify it, you know. Right. The, the striking connection between Tolkien and the Beowulf poet, apart from being re reincarnations of each other or whatever, is that um, they were both uh, devout Christians. Um, but they set their poems, their works, in uh, eras which were definitely not Christian. Um, right. The uh, Beowulf poet is talking about, we know, the early 6th century when the missionaries hadn't got there yet. And uh, uh, Tolkien, of course, is setting his work way, 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 way before, way, way before uh, the Christian era. So what are these heroes? Well, Christians have a word for people like that. It used to be Pagani, pagans. Uh, but mm. the Old English translation of that was, and a very good translation, was Hethna, heathens. Okay, so Beowulf and everyone around him, they were all heathens. And Aragorn and all the people around him, they were all heathens. They must have been. They couldn't have been anything else. But neither Tolkien nor the Beowulf poet will admit that. And that's a very strange thing. Um, they have set their works in a kind of theological neutral space. And uh, the thing that I always then make a botch of is that uh, the word Hethna in Beowulf actually occurs six times, six times, but twice it refers to Grendel, twice it refers to the dragon's gold, which of course comes from way back, and only twice does it refer to the human characters, and both those uses are very dubious. They are probably mistakes. They have probably been added in by a copyist writing 300 years after the Beowulf poet with very different attitudes. But Tolkien didn't believe either of them. He thought they were both mistakes. Uh, and it, I actually looked the word heathen up in Lord of the Rings. And uh, guess how many times it crops up? Twice. <laughs> but each time, it's, um, it's not the characters. It's people far back. Heathen kings, says Gandalf, and Denethor when he is about to commit suicide. Uh, so heathens are actually not us. It's those other people. And uh, Beowulf uh, really has pretty much the same idea. We're not heathens. Monsters are heathens. They're over there. We are here. So that's actually, in both cases, the, uh, uh, the, the, the authors are, um, well, disguising something or avoiding something because they do not want to um, uh, present their characters negatively. Uh, and that's a very strange thing, actually. And I don't think Tolkien would have thought of it if he hadn't been soaked in Beowulf from a very early age, or quite an early age. He must have come across it when he was a student at Oxford, say, when he was about, I don't know, um, I've forgotten when he actually ended up at Oxford, about 18, I should think. Um, yeah, that would be about right. Um, so uh, that's that's a very big uh, uh, uh part of his inspiration, I think. And then there are a lot of things which are much smaller, sort of micro elements. But there's also, as I point out, there are whole passages which just follow the layout of Beowulf point for point. One is the mm. approach of um, uh, Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas and Gandalf to um, Medusel, to Edoras. And I discussed that in some detail. But actually, it just follows... <coughs> what happens in Beowulf, step by step. And there's even a point where there's um, a proverbial statement in Beowulf, which has foxed everybody, foxed everybody. They're quite badly translated. And Tolkien obviously brooded on it, and he produced a different version of it, which I think expresses the sense of it, uh, which is you've got to make your mind up sometimes. Um, and you've got to make your mind up, even if you don't know exactly what's right. Uh, so uh, he gets he gets that across in a proverbial statement, which is in exactly the same place as it was in Beowulf. Um, and the other thing, actually, is ho the Hobbit. Um, the whole process of Bilbo goes down the tunnel, steals a cup, brings it back. Dragon wakes up, 
comes around in fury, attacks everybody. That's all what it says uh, in uh, in Beowulf, uh, where we have the same sequence of events, you might say. Somebody steals a cup, the dragon wakes up, turns up, burns down the bright halls. That's, that's a quote from Beowulf. Uh, and that's just the same as burning down Lake Town. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, I think on that kind of verbal level and the narrative level and the philosophical level and i can't think of any other levels but if there was <laughs> another level i'm sure we would say that uh, that uh, tolkien was on it with the beowulf poet right yeah, that's uh, it, that's that's what i think it's very interesting to me to uh, to dig into those uh, minute details, as you say, the the section in your essay uh, in the book about the approach to Medicelle is uh, is very interesting and and as you say, uh, detailed, right? It's a, exactly the same yeah, approach yeah, in yeah. Beowulf and there. So those kind of minute details are very interesting to me. But I also like what you were talking about earlier with the word "those." You know, who who sent? Yeah. Uh, who who are these those who sent him? Hmm. Um, and his, his, uh, shall we call it daring, his adventurousness when it comes to uh, back formation of mythology, these legends. Mm-hmm. Um, he, th- there, I, I apologize. I need to find the line that you wrote. Um, it, it would, it would, of course, be rash to try to reconstruct it. Speaking of something else, I think at the moment, uh, it would, of course, be rash to try to reconstruct it. So that is what Tolkien did. He, he had a sort of <laughs> adventurousness with uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to reconstruct these things. Maybe you would do a better job of this than I would, but can you explain to our listeners um, what back formation is and why he was so uh, unique in his approach to it? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, in a way, I don't think he was unique. Uh, the whole well, um, system had first been developed by none other than Jacob Grimm of Grimm's Fairy Tales. And could I just point out that the bestseller of the 19th century was Grimm's Fairy Tales, and the bestseller mm. of the 20th century was Tolkien. And both of them had a, uh, one in, invented and the other developed comparative philology. And the way this works is, suppose you have, um, I'm just trying to think, we have, uh, um, um, uh, 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 an old Norse word, which is alvar, meaning elves, and you have an old English word, ilva, uh, which means elves, uh, you can then actually uh, work out with a bit of luck what the word was before the languages separated. Because at one time, uh, they were all speaking, the ancestors of uh, the Norsemen, the ancestors of the English, they were all speaking what we call Proto-Germanic. And actually what Grimm did was encourage people to work out Proto-Germanic, uh, which they did on a verbal level. You sorted out the words. and uh, But the point, again, one of the points was, if they all shared the word, then they probably shared the concept. So once you figured out that they have a shared word for, should we say, dwarf. The next question is, well, what did they mean? So you go from the verbal level to the conceptual level. Um, and uh, actually, in a way, uh, once, once people mastered the grim uh, method, they started using it on anything. Um, one, of my, one of my little demonstrations, actually, is, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, the Italian word for five is cinque, and the English word for five is five. They're the same word. How did that come about? Well, Latin is quinque, but in Italic languages and Celtic languages, qu and p often were variants of each other. So the another another form of quinque was something like pempe. Ah, yes, but. Uh, Germanic languages uh, relate to Celtic to classical languages by having a f instead of a p, as in pater Latin, father English. So pempe becomes femfe. <laughs> Sorry, I can't say it because of my tooth, but um, it's something <laughs> like femfe. And of course, that's really quite close to German finf. Yes, but. There's another change, which is very marked in English, which is they have a habit, the old English, they had a habit of 
deleting the nasal and extending the vowel in front of it. So instead of uh, gans, they said gos. And instead of fünf, they said fief. And then in another sound change, the E becomes I, as in, well, I'm trying to think. Well, they said ritan, and we say right. So that's absolutely standard. Mm. You have a, a string of, I don't know how many that was, four or five sound changes, which all work perfectly regularly, and you get a word which doesn't, two words which don't look like each other at all, but they are related to each other. So that kind of thing, it's quite fun, actually. Um, um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, um, what is the Latin equivalent of thatch? You know, what you put on a you roof. got me there. I don't know. Well, that's right. Actually, I think I've forgotten. It's something like tagmen. Uh, there is a, a, a Latin word which, which, which uh, 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 exactly corresponds to it. And there usually is if you know enough about the languages. Well, okay. Um, that's the way that uh, that uh, philologists work. They reconstruct. They, as you say, they could, they find out by back formation. They work out what the ancestor of the word was, even though it's never been recorded. And they got better and better at it. Um, so it became a, a you know a, a, an amusing and interesting technique, and it had other effects which we needn't go into. But uh, one of them was, in a way, trying to reconstruct cultures, uh, as Tolkien does with the Riders of Rohan. Um, and, well, I, there are all kinds of other things one could, one could bring in there. Um, but perhaps that's enough about back formation and stuff. Um, it's, all, it's, it's all part of the way Tolkien worked. He started with details, but the details kind of grew. Actually, I'll give you one other example. Um, one of the things about non-paganism in uh, in Beowulf is uh, lots of things are just not there, which you would expect from a heathen society, like slaves. There aren't any slaves mm. in Beowulf. Well, there is. There's, there may be one. The person who stole the cup from the dragon's barrow in the manuscript, uh, what, what he is, is th, blur, 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 th, plus three letters. Now, most people say theo, slave okay some people say thane thane but tolkien of course who always had to do things different he decided it was theof thief and what's bail what's ba not bill what's bilbo bilbo, yeah. bilbo? He, he's a professional thief isn't he he's a burglar so actually Bilbo is in Beowulf in a sort of a way. Uh, it's just that um, it's been obliterated by a, by a manuscript blur. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I can never tell which, in which order Tolkien thought things, but that's the kind of thing he thought. Uh, he was capable of digging meaning out of uh, extremely unpromising uh, uh, areas. Um, Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Sorry. We were go we were, what was the next thing I was supposed to add, sir? Um, no, that's that's fine. That's fine. I I think you you have touched on the other thing I was saying, which is uh, okay. So what is back formation, but also what makes Tolkien different? As you say, okay, maybe not unique. That might have been too strong a word, but he, uh, as you say, his mind seemed to work differently. He's a, a fascinating person to learn about because um, in uh, one of my favorite moments in Humphrey Carpenter's biography of him was when you get to the middle of the book and he just stops and says, and then nothing else really happened. You know, he's, a, he's a, a terrible subject for a biography because he's yeah, you know, yeah, on, on yeah, a surface level, so, yeah. not very interesting. No, yeah. you know, there's no violence or salacious sexual details or anything like that. He just lived his life and he was a professor and he, uh, you know, made mistakes and loved his family and, and all the normal people things. But then you dig in a little bit more and you go, no, this guy was a little different, wasn't he? His, his mind. Just there was worked. a lot happening in here, basically. That's right. Yes, and that's it, what exactly. biographers find difficult. Um, okay. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite true. Uh, uh, I, it always strikes me, actually, uh, uh, grumbling slightly here, that um, people who write biographies of famous writers don't like reading books much. But what do they think their subjects did all the time? They read books all the time, all the time. 
uh, and uh, <laughs> um, and and that you really need to have that kind of background, I think, to understand them. Um, so, uh, uh, but Tolkien, I would say, was quite in quite capable of taking interest in the telephone directory, and he was also quite capable of getting ideas by looking out of the window. Um, for instance, uh, what was I thinking of? Um, uh, the Woses, you know, of Gone Buri Gone. Where do they mm. come from? Well, I, I, this is actually too long a, 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 a trail to follow. But actually, Tolkien's office in Leeds, like mine, was on Woodhouse Lane. But it wasn't Woodhouse Lane. It was Woodhouse Lane, because in Leeds, they don't say, huh, in cases like that. And it wasn't Woodhouse Lane. It was Woodhouse Lane. It was Woodhouse Lane. It was where the Woodhouses mm, yeah. lived. Uh, okay, I'm sure Tolkien figured that out, same as I did, but I had his hint to help me, and he figured it out for himself. I'll tell you another one. Um, a pal of mine was called Sturzacker, and I said to him one day, uh, oh, that's a German name, isn't it? Sturzacker. Uh, and he said, nope. He said, it's, uh, it's Old Norse. I said, what do you know about Old Norse? You're a mathematician. Um, he said, yeah, it's Sturz Acker, uh, which means the, the field of strife. And I said, where did you get that idea from? And he looked at me and he said, Tolkien told me. Really? <coughs> I thought, <coughs> okay, that's a trump card. <coughs> but he'd known Tolkien. <coughs> they were both fellows of, of Merton before I knew him. Uh, and obviously Tolkien looked at someone like Sturz Acker and and thought about what his name meant. Um, and that was just the kind of thing he did all the time, all the time. Yeah. Look at Farmer Giles of Ham. It's, it's about place names. You know, Worming Hall, Tame. Why are these places called that? Okay, here's a story, explains it. Uh, well, it's not the way most people yeah. get their ideas from, but that's the way he got his ideas from. Yep. Um, Right. Uh, so very, I, uh, very interesting. To... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you mentioned Humphrey Carpenter, and, you know, and from then on, nothing happened. Mm. Well, Humphrey, um, I, uh, <laughs> you already said, uh, I, I feel that Humphrey, um, uh, whom I know, I also used to know quite well, uh, he... Um, he missed the point in a sort of way. And recently, actually, uh, I've I, I written an article saying that Humphrey missed the point um, much earlier, much earlier. Uh, and to see this, uh, if you go to academia.edu, again, that, that website I mentioned, look me up, Tom Shippey, and then look for an article or a paper called A Steep Learning Curve, Tolkien and the British Army on the Somme. Because actually, Humphrey got that completely wrong, dead wrong. And it's important. It's important because Humphrey, who know, doesn't know anything about, about the World War I or, any, or history, really, as far as I can see, um, he uh, uh, assumed that everything in World War I is total incompetence, mud, blood, you know, uh, uh, everyone is completely stupid. Uh, no, actually, um, it was like that at the start, sure. But it wasn't like that by the time Tolkien went into action. There is a complete dis difference between the disaster of 1st July 1916, when Tolkien's friend Rob Gilson was killed, uh, and the complete success of October, was it October 21st, 1916, when Tolkien went over the top, and his attack was completely successful. Completely well, you know, well planned, clear objective, objective taken, very good effect. And this is something that I think we all, we really ought to notice. Tolkien went out in a blaze of glory. Really? Uh, what happened after the attack? The day after it, his battalion was paraded by the brigade commander who said, jolly good chaps. And the next day they were paraded by the divisional commander who said, jolly good chaps. And the next day they were paraded by the corps commander who said, jolly good chap. And the next day, they were paraded by the big boss himself, Field Marshal Haig, and he said, jolly well done, chaps. 
So four days, one after another, he got congratulated. And the day after that, he went sick with trench fever and never mm. returned to active service again. So, you know, could you go out better than that? Huh? So, um, so what... So you're saying that that would have affected uh, his outlook on this sort of thing because it was accolade after accolade for a exactly. heroic charge. Exactly. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the yeah. word I, I was dodging, uh, which is heroic. Because after First World War, there was a very pervasive feeling of irony. There weren't any heroes. The whole thing had been a bloody disaster. There's a book which... I, I recommend that you never read, called Death of a Hero. It's so bitter, you know, I, I, I just... Anyway, th th there's no such thing as a hero. Um, but Tonkin didn't, didn't buy into that, I don't think. He very obviously didn't buy into that. He said it in his 1936 lecture. Uh, the, the, uh, th those of us who, who have heard of heroes and have indeed met them. Yeah, okay. He thought his... Uh, fellow combatants, he thought they were heroes. Um, okay, but once again, and this is again me uh, looking things up on the search program, Tolkien is very reluctant to use the word hero. Um, do you know how many times it comes up in Lord of the Rings? Well, they actually, do. I've forgotten. It's about six, but almost all of them, well, they're either far in the past, um, you know, mm. uh, uh, in the in the appendices sometimes, or else they're kind of jokes. Sam, Samwise, Sam uh, uh, says to uh, Gollum, would you like to be a hero, Gollum? Uh, Sam thinks of himself as Samwise the hero, uh, uh, Samwise the strong, hero of the age, and then he thinks, no, no, that's just nonsense. So these words are rejected. There's only once, I think, where it's kind of taken seriously, and that's when Gandalf says to Bilbo near the end, uh, no hero can play more than a small part. And Bilbo stands up and bows in appreciation of the compliment. But he clearly thinks it's not true. He isn't a hero. And Gandalf says, yes, you are a hero. But there's, that's the kind of argument in a way. Can a Bilbo be a hero? If he is, he's a quite different kind of hero from the sort that Gandalf mentioned at the start of The Hobbit when he said, we haven't got those anymore. They've all kind of retired. Um, so basically, Tolkien, the founder of heroic fantasy, had complex views of heroism, but he did not share the ironic view which Humphrey Carpenter has been taught. And actually, as I say, if you if you look at my and my colleague John Bourne's article on academia, you'll see what we think about it. Okay, mm. well... Um, uh, what other words can I remember to look up in uh, in uh, in the in the search uh, engine for well, ordering? Let me actually. Uh, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> me, I do it all the time. For, <laughs> because your your discussion of of the hero and heroic and and all of that and looking back into the past to to claim that word reminds me of what we were just talking about with heathen. Uh, where yeah, yeah, this tends yeah. to be a word that's used as we're looking back toward, yeah. uh, you know, those in, in history, you know, uh, fairly yeah. recent or ancient, ancient history. Is mm. there something to the idea that we have to wait for history to decide who is truly a heathen, somebody who is a hero? And, and we can't, yeah. uh, it, would it be too presumptuous to decide who are the heroes today. I, I, I don't know what to make of this uh, that you're bringing up, but I, I, it's tickling my brain somewhere. Well, again, I think I know what Tolkien thought um, from talking to him, uh, because uh, when I was talking to him over dinner at Merton, he, uh, I'd been talking to him about, the, about our rugby football team, which you'd think had nothing to do with any of this. But I mentioned... Uh, a guy's name, Peter Neave, N-E-A-V-E. And Tolkien perked up and said, what do you think the word Neave derives from? And I said, well, it could be a nickname, Fist, Old Norse Hnevi, Fist. And he, he said, yes, which meant no, of course. Uh, and he uh, said, uh, uh, but it could be actually the old hero name, Hnaf, which occurs in Beowulf. And, of course, the reason Tolkien was interested was it was his aunt's name. 
his aunt was Jane Neve. And his point, which he then elaborated on, was that he thought, in a sort of a way, the heroes had not gone away. They were still there. They were still there in people's names. They were still there in um, in place names. Uh, I, I, I dug out a few of those, which I don't think I can explain quickly. But he clearly thought that that sort of... Um, heroic legendarium, if I can use the phrase, that heroic legendarium was still with us. It hadn't gone away. We just didn't notice it anymore. I thought, yeah, well, um, I guess you could be right there. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the past is still with us, shall swimming. I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating, fascinating. Well, uh, Professor, I know we uh, we're running up on our time, and so perhaps we should uh, shift one more time uh, back to your copy of Beowulf. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'll tie it in with Tolkien once more, uh, and that is yeah. uh, just just my own personal testimonial for your work, uh, both here and and elsewhere. My one of my favorite concepts from Tolkien actually comes from Leaf by Niggle uh, in when he's in purgatory yeah. and he's yeah. tending the valley and it becomes a way station uh, for those yeah. passing from one life to the next. Uh, one of the most beautiful things I know of from his writing. But anyway, he, there's, to my mind, the idea that this is how he thought of his work. Um, when you read the Lord of the Rings, when you dig into yeah. his yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. his mythology, the idea was that this is a way station. This is where people can come in, yeah. uh, enjoy a, a great story, but then also have their imaginations uh, peaked uh, to have an idea that they need to go and, and learn more about uh, these people yeah. and these places and, and uh, where he got his ideas. I, I love people who read the Lord of the Rings and then say, oh, and, and then I just had to learn more about Beowulf, more about the yeah, Eddas, yeah, yeah. uh, more yeah. about the Kalevala, uh, yeah. this this idea of a way station. So anyway, the reason I bring all of that up is because that's one of the things that I love so much yeah. about a book like this is your translation is, uh, is accessible and uh, interesting and uh, well thought out. And then you get to, as you say, the commentary uh, that, uh, that Leonard Nydorf did where he has this incredibly extensive bibliography. And as you say, it's too much for you to probably sit down and actually go through. But a, a volume like this is a great way station for somebody who says, you yeah, know, I'd yeah, like to learn yeah. more about these things. Yeah, yeah. And it will, yeah. you stop in this place and it will send you in a million directions wherever your fancy takes you. Uh, you can yeah. learn more from it. Yeah. So, so really been enjoying this so far. Yeah, well, that uh, gives me a chance to say what uh, what Len Nidoff told me to say, which is to tell everybody first, uh, if you if you want to buy this book, well, that's the one. And the other thing is, follow at Uppsala Books on social media. It's up there on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and whatever the others are, I forget. Uh, but uh, at Uppsala Books is the sort of tag, I suppose. Uh, so have a look at that, see what comes up. And uh, actually, you, you will be kept up to date with things. So uh, I hope you'll all, uh, all, uh, all do that and uh, help to spread the word. That's the idea. Okay. Perfect. Well, Tom Shippey, thank you so much for taking some time uh, to chat with me today. This has been a, a special pleasure for me. Uh, and I, I really appreciate your insights and uh, your time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Craig. Very, very happy to appear. And another time, perhaps we can talk about something else. That would be good, too. <laughs> I would love to. All right. <laughs>